Even while the Apostle Paul was writing, men were at work trying to corrupt God's word. After most of the apostles had been killed, John had been exiled to the island of Patmos. He showed the believers which manuscripts were of God. In the city of Antioch, where we were first called Christians, true believers were making exact copies of the original manuscripts. However, that wasn't the case in Alexandria, Egypt. They didn't like certain parts of scripture, so they removed passages and altered others. And so today we have two Bibles, two long chains of Bibles that both claim to be the Word of God. So we're going to look at the differences. Let's start with Alexandria. This is Origen. He was one of the so-called scholars in Alexandria. He didn't believe that Jesus was God Almighty. So he and others like him removed this verse out of the scriptures. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This is one of our Trinity verses, but he didn't like it, so he had it removed. If Oregon were alive today, he would be classified as a Jehovah's Witness. Then we have Eusebius. Eusebius was given the job of producing 50 Greek Bibles for the Roman Catholics. Eusebius believed the same way that Origen believed. He wasn't about to touch any of the good manuscripts of Antioch, so he used the corrupted manuscripts of Alexandria, Egypt. The Roman Catholic Church grew in power, and out of the 50 Bibles that Eusebius had made comes the Latin Vulgate translation. The Latin Vulgate became the official Bible for all Roman Catholics. And if you had any other Bible version, that was outlawed and you were put to death. Then, in the mid to late 1800s, these two gentlemen, Westcott and Hort, decide to make an updated Greek New Testament. They consult two Catholic manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. Now these two manuscripts disagreed with the majority of good manuscripts we have available, and they even disagreed with each other. But Westcott and Hort somehow blended them together and wrote the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament. And now, unfortunately, when a book publisher wants to make their own version of the Bible so they can get a copyright and make more money, they reach for this convenient Westcott and Hort New Testament. Meanwhile, the true believers were spreading out and hiding from the Roman Catholics. They continued to carefully preserve God's word. From this group of manuscripts, good Bibles were produced. Tyndale's New Testament, which he almost completed the Old Testament before the Catholics caught him and burned him. Then Miles Coverdale, the Geneva Bible, and finally the authorized King James Bible. These all come from the same group of texts coming out of Antioch. So let's see what's different about the two Bible families. Here we have Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? When he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. This is a verse that's prophetic, and it's referring to Jesus that would happen later on. The wounds in his hands are from the crucifixion. So let's see what the other, the other Bibles that come from Alexandria have to say. Here's the English Standard Version. This one's becoming very popular very fast. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Well, obviously there's a big difference there between hands and back. So, what does the New Living Translation say? And if someone asks then, what about these wounds on your chest? He will say, I was wounded at my friend's house. So the wound was on the back, and now it's moved to the chest. The New Life version says, If someone asks him, What are these sores on your back? He will answer, They are the sores I received in the house of my friend. So the sores have gone from the back to the chest, and now to the back again. The Holman Christian Standard Bible. This is produced by many Southern Baptists, and it is slowly replacing a lot of the more traditional Bibles they have. If someone asks him, what are these wounds on your chest? So it goes from back to chest to back to chest again. The NIV. If someone asks him, what are these wounds on your body? He will answer the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. 
Well, okay, now, now the wound is everywhere on your body, or anywhere. The contemporary English version. If any of them are asked why they are wounded, they will answer. Wounded, it's not even a physical or bodily wound. You could be wounded of the heart. They don't even name a place on the body that he's wounded. The message, probably the worst of them all. And if someone asks, if someone says, and so where did you get that black eye? They'll say, I ran into a door at a friend's house. And speaking of the message, here's Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope becomes, in the message, may the God of green hope. I don't even know what to say to that. And here's that first John chapter 5, verse 7. And I've even thrown in verse 8. And I've highlighted the words in yellow. So you can see they also mess with part of verse 8. As you'll see, they are gone in the other versions. In fact, the other versions kind of sound like they're boring us to tears here, talking about the spirit, water, and blood. New American Standard, English Standard, New Living. You see it's always missing. The Contemporary English Darby's translation, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and they all agree with the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation. Now right there I'm getting kind of worried for these guys. They're in total agreement with the Jehovah's Witness. And there's even the Weist New Testament. Weist doesn't put in scripture numbers, but I went ahead and put in the numbers of the verses here so that you would see just exactly what's missing. It's gone. It's totally gone. And you'll notice he, uh, he refers to God or Jesus as the one. The one. You start seeing this a lot in New Age material. Now, I'm not saying this is uh, you know a New Age New Testament, so don't misquote me. But uh, I get worried if they keep referring to God as the one all the time. Now, you can maybe do it once or twice, but you do need to refer to him by a name at some point. Mark chapter 1, verse 2. As it is written in the prophets... Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And you'll notice I have highlighted the word prophets. They're going to mess with that word. Here's the Amplified Bible, just as written in the prophet Isaiah. So the Amplified goes ahead and names that prophet that they're quoting here. Isaiah. New Living Translation says Isaiah. The Message says Prophet Isaiah. New Century Version, Prophet Isaiah. The English Standard Version, Isaiah. Contemporary English Version, Isaiah. The New English Bible, which is a Catholic Bible. The Prophet Isaiah. Darby's Translation says Isaiah. The Southern Baptist Holman Christian Standard Bible says Isaiah. The NIV says Isaiah. And the Jehovah's Witness say Isaiah. Well, what's the problem here? It almost makes it look like these are better because they've gone out of their way to identify what prophet it is. Well, the King James says prophets, plural, more than one prophets. The real problem is, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, was never said by Isaiah. It was said by Malachi. And here it is. Here's the verse I just had, Mark chapter 1, verse 2, as it is written in the prophets. And here you see it in Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, verse 3 of the Gospel of Mark, that verse is Isaiah, but not verse 2. Therefore, the King James gets it right by saying it is written in the prophets, plural. Nobody likes Malachi these days anymore for some reason. Matthew chapter 7, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few that be that find it. The new King James says, Difficult is the way. Now is it difficult to go to heaven? English Standard Version, For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. Is it hard to get to heaven? 
New Revised Standard Version says hard. The Message says vigorous. New Life Version hard. Holman Christian Standard says difficult. New Living says difficult. Contemporary English says hard. And the Jehovah's Witness says cramped. It's not hard to get to heaven. It's narrow. Proverbs 18.24 A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Okay, well that makes sense. If you want a lot of friends, you got to be friendly. Okay, I get it. NIV says a man of many companions may come to ruin. Are these saying the same thing? New American Standard Bible, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. This doesn't make sense. New Century Version, some friends may ruin you. New Living, there are friends who destroy each other. The Holman Christian Standard, a man with many friends may be harmed. I don't want these kind of friends. The Jehovah's Witness, there exist companions disposed to break one another to pieces. All these new versions are agreeing with the Jehovah's Witness. There's a pattern developing here. Mark 10:24. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Now I've got the words them that trust in riches underlined because that is the qualifier. That's what they're talking about. It's what Jesus is talking about. The NIV says, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. What? They're basically telling children it's hard to get to heaven. And notice they're transposing the word is and it. King James says, how hard is it for them? NIV says, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. But notice what's missing. The qualifying statement, those that trust in riches, is gone. New American Standard, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Where's the part about those that trust in riches? This verse is a warning, but it's about those that trust in money. English Standard Version, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. I think they're sending the wrong message here. Contemporary English version, it's terribly hard to get into God's kingdom. Well, how nice. Well, you get one of these new versions, and you tell the little boys and girls, now this is going to be easy to read. Wait till they get to that verse, how hard it is to get to the kingdom of God. New century version, my children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. New living, dear children, it is very hard to get into the kingdom of God. Don't even bother trying. Holman Christian. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And they all agree with the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation. Children, how difficult a thing it is to enter the kingdom of God. That's sad. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Now I'm only going to quote part of the verse. He hath sent me to heal the broken hearted. Heal the broken hearted is underlined. So guess what they mess up. NIV. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. But nowhere in there do they mention the brokenhearted. The New American Standard. Set me to proclaim release the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set free those who are oppressed. Nowhere in there is heal the brokenhearted. Now, question. Is Jesus the Word of God? Yes, he is. Jesus is reading from the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. Does Jesus know the Word of God ahead of time before he reads it? Yes, he does. So if it's written in the scroll of Isaiah, Jesus would know about it, and Jesus would be able to quote it. And if something were missing, Jesus would notice that too, wouldn't he? And here, in the NIV and the New American Standard, we look in Isaiah chapter 61, and yes, the word brokenhearted is in there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, But I say unto you, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now I've highlighted the words without a cause. That's the qualifying statement. NIV, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Well, wait a minute. 
Where's the without a cause part? Without that, anybody that gets angry is subject to judgment. New Living says, But I say if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Well, unfortunately, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 5, then Jesus looks around at them in anger. But according to the NIV, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Does this mean in the NIV that Jesus is now subject to judgment? It's also in the New American Standard Version. After looking around at them with anger. New Living. He looked around at them angrily. English Standard Version. But he looked around at them with anger. And in the English Standard Version it says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. According to the English Standard Version, Jesus might be in a little bit of trouble here. They've taken out the, the part about without a cause, and it's causing them a problem. It's a problem with all of these. The Darby, the Contemporary, the American Standard, today's New International Version, Jerusalem Bible, all of these. Hosea. Why would they mess with poor Hosea? You know, most Christians don't even know Hosea is a book in the Bible. But they're going to mess with it. Chapter 11, verse 12. But Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. Okay, well that makes sense. Uh, Jesus is descended from the tribe of Judah. He rules with God. Okay, yeah, we get it. Let's see what the others one. Let's see what the other versions do. NIV says, and Judah is unruly against God. Judah rules with God. Judah is unruly against God. Are these saying the same thing? Are they different? Can two things be different and be the same? No. Then which one of these is the Word of God? Or does God ever say the opposite? Matthew chapter 8, verse 19, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, what do they say that in the other versions? New King James says, Teacher. New American Standard says, Teacher. You see, everywhere you have the word Master, they're going to lessen it just a little bit. Everywhere you have the word Lord, they're going to call him Sir. Master becomes Teacher. They just lower him one notch. You say, well, what's the big deal? Here's the NIV says, teacher. The message says, a religion scholar asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever. According to the message, he doesn't even call him anything. Weiss expanded calls him teacher. The Jehovah's Witness call him teacher. You know, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to be aligned with the Jehovah's the Jehovah Witness Bible. No thanks. Here's where it really becomes a problem. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. New King James says, Do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Okay, they've lessened his title a little bit. What's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. Let's leave that New King James verse up there. Do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher. But let's check out 1 Corinthians 12.28. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. God the Father is calling people to be teachers. And in these newer translations, they have Jesus telling people, don't be called a teacher. Well, they're contradicting each other. God the Father and God the Son don't agree, apparently. And we can't have that in a, something that's calling itself a Bible. It's also a problem in the book of Ephesians. Some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. It's a, this is a problem for the NIV, New Living, New International Reader Version, the New International Version for the UK, that's in England, today's New International Version, the Jerusalem Bible, English Bible, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, Weasts, Philip's New Testament. It's a problem. In these other versions, 
they don't call him teacher. They lower him to instructor, leader, leader, director, instructor, guide. Do not be a called a guide, for there's only one. Oh, come on. Now, who killed Goliath? Everybody should know the answer to that. Second Samuel 21:19, And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanahan, the son of Jerojom, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. Slew the brother of Goliath is underlined, highlighted. Guess what's going to be missing? The NIV says, In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanahan, the son of Jehoram, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite. So who are they saying killed Goliath? They're saying Elhanahan did. Now, every boy and girl in Sunday school class knows that David killed Goliath. English Standard Version has the same problem. They have Elhanahan killing Goliath. New American Standard, Elhanahan killing Goliath. But let's look at 2 Samuel 21, 19, King James, and 1 Chronicles 25, King James. One says, slew the brother of Goliath. One gives us an extra detail, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath. And now we figure out the name of the brother of Goliath. Everything's fine and dandy here with the King James. Well, let's check out the NIV. Second Samuel says, Elhanahan killed Goliath. But then it disagrees with itself. In the NIV it says, Elhanahan, or Elhanan, however you pronounce it, killed Lami, the brother of. The NIV is disagreeing with itself. So is the New Revised Standard Version. So is the New American Standard Version. These are all disagreeing with each other. This is a mistake. So when an atheist comes to you and says, hey, there's mistakes in the Bible, and they show you one of these versions, they're right. I'm, s I'm sorry to say that. Now, Green's literal translation almost gets it right. They have struck one of Goliath. Now, struck one of what? It's, it's almost as if they were getting ready to say brother, but at the last minute they failed miserably like all the others. Now, is there any healing going on? Mark chapter 3, verse 15, And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Well, that's a great verse. I hope no one messes with it. NIV, and to have authority to drive out demons. Well, what about the power to heal sicknesses? That's, uh, that's missing. I believe in healing. I think it ought to be in there. New century version, and to have authority to cast out demons. English standard, nothing about healing. Nothing about healing sickness. New Jerusalem Bible with power to drive out devils. This is only half the verse. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. Many people have this one memorized. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now surely they're not going to mess with this one. Here's the contemporary English version. You people of Judah are so deceitful that you even fool yourselves and you can't change. Are they kidding us? Ah, words escape me. The contemporary English version was written by a guy that lives in Springfield, Missouri. I, I have yet to meet this guy, but I, I don't know what I would say to him. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. This verse is yanked out. Most people that have a newer translation, they have a Catholic-friendly Bible. How do you go to a Catholic and tell them you shouldn't, you shouldn't baptize infants? They're too young. They have yet to make a declaration of support or or a statement of faith regarding Christ as their Savior. We get that from this verse 37, but it's missing. Now, don't be fooled by the contemporary English version. The way they, they list the numbers of the verses, 36-37, they want you to believe they've combined verse 36 and 37 and made it one nice little paragraph. Well, they haven't. 
because 37 is really missing. They're just not being honest with you. 37 should say, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's that declaration of faith. This is the Ethiopian eunuch saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And a baby cannot say that. And that's why they've yanked this verse out of there. It's gone from the message. It's gone from the NIV. Try to find it in your, your Bible. It's gone from the Catholic New English Bible. Now, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth out, not out, but by prayer and fasting. And then they go on to verse 22. This is referring to a demon. The disciples were having trouble casting it out. And Jesus pretty much had to do it. And when they asked him, how were you able to do it? And we weren't. Jesus explains to them, this one was a tough one to get rid of. You needed a lot of prayer and fasting. The New Living Translation does not have verse 21. Now, I think verse 21 is pretty important. This is telling the disciples how to do it. You may run into this as a problem. You may come across a demon-possessed person, and, and it's going to give you trouble casting that one out. You might need to know the formula, if you'll allow me to use the word formula. You might need to know this little tidbit of information that Jesus is giving you. But it's gone. New Living Translation doesn't have it. The NIV doesn't have it. The message doesn't have it. Contemporary English doesn't surprise me. And they all agree 100% with Jehovah's Witness. Mark 9.29. This, this covers the same thing. You know, every now and then the gospel writers, they would cover the same events. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So if they do bother to have this verse in there, they remove the part about fasting. New American Standard Bible. This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Well, I'm sorry. Weren't the disciples praying already? You know, when you when you try to cast a, a devil out, you know, you, you pray to God, Lord, cast this thing out, be gone, get away, and all that. Weren't they already praying? Where's the fasting? New Living Translation. There's no fasting. Why are they hiding this? Isn't this something we need to know? We're going to do battle in the spiritual world? Don't we need to know all the things we need to know? That sounds redundant, I know. But New Century Version doesn't have fasting. Contemporary English Version doesn't have fasting. NIV doesn't have fasting. Revised Standard Version, no fasting. The easy-to-read version doesn't have fasting. It's very easy to read. You know, when you don't have as many words to read, it, it gets easier to read. The Good News Translation, there's no good news here, it doesn't have the word fasting. English Standard Version, there's no fasting, just prayer. American Standard, no, no fasting. The Complete Jewish Bible, I would argue that it's complete, doesn't have fasting. The New Jerusalem Bible doesn't have fasting. J.B. Rotherham Emphasized Bible. No, I just wanted to show you all these to let you know I'm being very thorough. God's Word Translation. Now, you've got to be real egotistical to make a translation and call it God's Word Translation and then not include all of God's words. I, I'm speechless. Philip's New Testament doesn't have it. And they all agree with the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation. This kind cannot get out by anything except prayer. Fasting is completely removed. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 5. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. That gets changed to hunger. Now, if you get hungry... That does not mean that you are fasting. The Amplified says hunger, no fasting. 
the message working without eating you know there's many times I've skipped a meal although it may not you may not notice that when you look at me but that doesn't mean I'm fasting NIV says hunger Holman Christian Standard says times of hunger new life version without food let's go to 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 27 this first has the word hunger and fastings they're two different things in hunger and thirst in fastings often you've got both of these I wonder how they're gonna translate that in the newer translations new American standard I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst often without food well they're basically repeating themselves they've got one version of hunger and another version of hunger but they don't have fasting the message many a missed meal my goodness NIV I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food I like to repeat myself and say the same things and just use different words while not saying the word fastings Holman Christian Standard Bible the Southern Baptist friend hunger and thirst often without food now Proverbs chapter 26 verse 10 the great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and regardeth rewardeth excuse me transgressors the great God that formed all things this is a creation verse let's see what the English Standard Version says like an archer who wounds everyone is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard now I'm just gonna let that soak in for a little bit the great God that formed all things where in that verse is this archery practice coming from and where is it that I'm gonna shoot arrows at a uh, drunkard or I'm gonna give a job interview to a drunkard what where are they getting this stuff it should be a creation verse New Living Translation an employer who hires a fool is like an archer who shoots recklessly what contemporary English version it's no smarter to shoot arrows at ever every passerby than it is to hire a bunch of worthless nobodies does that sound like a Bible verse to you <sighs> Revelation 22 14 blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city praise God blessed are they that do his commandments uh-oh as you can see I've already got that highlighted what are they going to do to the commandments Holman Christian Standard blessed are those who wash their robes what's what's why are they talking about doing their laundry here washing their robes is this something I should be doing so that I can get into heaven is this works theology like the Catholics say you gotta work your way into heaven new American Standard blessed are those who wash their robes Revised Standard, blessed are those who wash their robes. NIV, blessed are those who wash their robes. English Standard, blessed are those who wash their robes. Over and over again. The message, how blessed are those who wash their robes. The New English Bible, which is a Catholic Bible, happy are those that wash their robes clean. Now i got to make sure it's really clean. Good News Translation, happy are those who wash their robes clean. New Century Version, happy are those that wash their robes. Contemporary English, God will bless all who have washed their robes. And they all agree with the Jehovah's Witness Bible, happy are those who wash their robes. Well, I don't want to be Jehovah's Witness. I want to be a child of God. And blessed are those that do His commandments. Luke 22, verse 44 and 45 this is around the crucifixion verse 45 says and the Sun was darkened this happens for let's see it was about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the all the earth until the ninth hour so the entire earth is going to be covered with three hours of darkness I wonder what they're going to do with that the good news translation says 
the whole country was in darkness. The whole country. I guess they're talking about Israel here. My Bible says over all the earth. So they're making this happen in a very smaller location. They're diminishing this miracle. It gets worse. New American Standard. Darkness fell over the whole land. Well, it depends on what you say the whole land is. Is that the whole earth or is that just one country? Or one area, one acre? What? Because the sun was obscured. From what? A flock of seagulls? What, what obscured it? Philip's New Testament. Darkness came over the whole countryside. For there was an eclipse of the sun. See, this wasn't a miracle. No, there's no miracles in the Bible. This was just an ordinary scientific phenomenon that happens from time to time, an eclipse. No big deal. It's even in the Moffat New Testament. The whole land owing to an eclipse of the sun. They're taking away a miracle here. John chapter 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You've got to believe on Jesus. Okay? You don't just believe in something silly like the Easter Bunny. I wonder what they're going to do with this verse. Holman Christian Standard. I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. Believes in what? Believes in who? Muhammad? Buddha? Confucius? NIV. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Believes on who? Believes what? New American Standard. He who believes. New Living. Anyone who believes. English Standard Version. Whoever believes has eternal life. Believes in what? New Century Version. I tell you the truth. Whoever believes has eternal life. What's missing here? Mark chapter 6, verse 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Well, now you may realize I've got the, that last sentence in a larger font. It's bolded. They're going to mess with that. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. But where's that warning about it's going to be better for Sada Gomorrah than for you? That's missing. We can't mention Sodom and Gomorrah in these newer versions. Why, you might begin to wonder what was wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah. And you might do some digging, and you might find out that they had a certain behavior in Sodom and Gomorrah. A certain behavior which is getting, if not glorified, it's certainly not being covered like it used to. The message, don't make a scene, shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Where's the warning about Sodom and Gomorrah? New Living Translation doesn't have the warning either. English Standard Version, there's no warning. Holman Christian, no warning. Jehovah's Witness doesn't have a warning. Once again, I don't want to have a Bible that aligns itself with the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Matthew 20, verse 16. For many be called, but few chosen. That's gone. It's gone. I'm getting tired of mentioning these other versions. It's just gone. New Living doesn't have it. Jehovah's Witness doesn't have it. You've got a Jehovah's Witness Bible, probably. Luke chapter 9, verse 55 and 56. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now I've got a big part of that underlined. It's going to be gone. But Jesus turned to rebuke them, and they went to another village. Wow, is Jesus a hothead? Jesus turns around and gets mad at them. Now let's get out of here. No, no, no. Where's the part about what Jesus is telling them? Where, where is he going to explain to him why he's upset with them? It's gone. 
For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. We can't have a verse in there about Jesus wanting to save them for some reason. Now you make an argument, well, yeah, but that, that good news appears in other places of the Bible. Well, sure, but I don't want to have to just go around searching for all this good news. I'd like to be able to read it as I go along, not have to really dig it out. Revised Standard Version, it's gone. But he turned to rebuke them, and they went somewhere else. English Standard, yep, gets mad, let's get out of here. New Living, it's gone. And they all agree with the Jehovah's Witness. He turned and rebuked them, so they went to a different village. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Get thee behind me, Satan. Why, the Catholics don't want to read that, because someone might think he's actually talking to Peter. And they love Peter in the Catholic Church. He's their first pope. Jesus answered, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What about the get behind me, Satan? Where is that? It's not in the English Standard Version. It's not in the New Living Translation. It's not in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Some people just love reading the Jehovah's Witness Bible. They have a different name on the cover, but they've got a Jehovah's Witness Bible that's very Catholic friendly. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Do they think we are so dumb that we don't know how to check the book of Deuteronomy and find this quote for ourselves? But they mess with it. A person does not live on bread alone. Where is that part about living on every word of God? It's not there. NIV. Don't live on bread alone. Message. At least the message says they're quoting Deuteronomy, and then they don't quote Deuteronomy correctly. It takes more than bread to really live. What a... Anyway. Contemporary English version. Jesus answered, The scriptures say no one can live only on food. Are you kidding me? No one can live only on <sighs> New Living Translation. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. They also say that they don't live by they live by every word of God, but you wouldn't know that reading the New Living. The Southern Baptist Friend says it is written man must not live on bread. Wow, we got the Adkins diet going on here. Jehovah's Witness, they agree wholeheartedly with these new translations. Man must not live by bread alone. Daniel chapter 3. Now this is where they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. And they saw a fourth person in there. And the Bible tells us he was like the Son of God. This is an early reference to Jesus. Now, many people want to have Jesus only being born, you know, around 2,000 years ago. But Jesus is always, he's, he's everlasting. He's always been around. They're going to take away this reference to the Son of God. New American says, he was like a son of the gods. Revised, a son of the gods. NIV, a son of the gods. Jehovah's Witness, the Son of the God. They all agree with the Jehovah's Witness. New American Standard, Son of the Gods. The Message, a Son of the Gods. Amplified, Son of the Gods. English Standard, a Son of the Gods. New Living, a God. Wow, that's different. And a contemporary English version, a God. The Good News says it was like an angel. If, if this isn't watered down, then I, I don't have a good definition of being watered down. Matthew 6.13 Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Those words are going to be gone. English Standard Version Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But the rest of that is gone. Is there any power in the kingdom of Jesus? Is there any glory? Will he last forever? That's all gone. NIV doesn't have it. 
New Living doesn't have it. Contemporary English, no surprise here, doesn't have it. New Revised Standard doesn't have it. The easy to read. <laughs> Extremely easy to read. Darby doesn't have it. Phillips doesn't have it. New Jerusalem doesn't have it. The Dewey Reams Catholic Bible doesn't have it. Jehovah's Witness doesn't have it. They all agree. And uh, the message. I wanted to read this one specifically. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blazing beauty. Yes, yes, yes. I feel like an idiot just for reading that. Matthew 27:35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. That last little part about it being a fulfilled prophecy is going to be gone. It's as if they don't want you to realize this was all prophesied. All this was going to happen to Jesus. None of these have it. None of these have it. Can they all agree with the Jehovah's Witnesses? I don't want to. Scripture gets fulfilled. Or does it? Mark 15:28, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. I wonder what the other versions have to say about this. Well, the NIV doesn't have it. New Living doesn't have it. English Standard doesn't have it. New Revised Standard doesn't have it. The Moffat New Testament doesn't have it. Weiss New Testament doesn't have it. Jerusalem doesn't have it. God's Word. The Bible in Basic English, none of these have it. Now these translations pretend to have verse 28 because they number their verse 27 with a dash, but those words aren't there. They're lying to you. It's not there, period. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Now you're going you're gonna to scream that I'm nitpicking here, but Joseph is not the father of Jesus, okay? Now he's He's the role of a stepfather, okay? Maybe the the uh, the family trait of being a carpenter, Jesus is going to maybe possess for a few years, but Joseph is not really the father of Jesus. New American Standard, and his father and mother were amazed. New Living, Jesus' parents were amazed. Well, God the Father is his parent. Was God the Father amazed? NIV, the child's father and mother marveled. Jehovah's Witness, its father and mother. I don't want a Bible that agrees with the Jehovah's Witnesses. But thou, Bethlehem. Uh, okay, we read this verse all the time. You know, around the, around the Christmas era. When uh, we're finding out when King Herod finds out. From what town is this Savior going to be born in? This is the verse they all go to. The very last word of the verse tells us that Jesus is from everlasting. He's eternal. He's always been here. Now they're going to take away that everlasting and they're going to give God, or they're going to, excuse me, they're going to give Jesus a beginning the New Revised Standard, from ancient days. That's how they end this verse. Not everlasting. Ancient days. Well, what day was that? So he had a beginning on a certain day. NIV, from ancient times. Now he's limited by time. I, I would expect Jesus to be above time. Outside of time. Not hindered by time. New living, the distant past. They, ha they have a beginning here. New century, from days long ago. Matthew 8, chapter 2. Now we're going to get into some verses about Jesus being worshipped. This is very appropriate. He's part of the Godhead. He should be worshipped. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord. Now I've got worshipped him underlined and Lord underlined. And there's a reason for that. The NIV says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Now I'm glad they kept the word Lord in there. But knelt before him is a little bit toned down, or if you'll allow me to use the term watered down, of worshipped him. 
Now, the kneeling part is going to change here. New American Standard says, bowed down before him. Well, which is it, guys? Did he kneel or bow? Contemporary English says he knelt in front of Jesus. Now he's back to kneeling again. New Century says he bowed down before him. It's either kneeling or bowing. They're not the same. Good News says he knelt down before him and said, Sir. I call a lot of people sir, usually strangers, when I'm arriving at a store with them and I open the door for them. I say, here you go, sir. But I only call one person Lord. I call a lot of people sir. Worldwide English, he kneeled in front of. Darby says he did him homage. That's easy to understand. English says uh, knelt before him. Jehovah's Witness began doing obeisance. And the Revised Standard says knelt before him. They can't make up their mind. Matthew 9.18, when he spake these things unto him, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him. New Living says he knelt before him. New America Standard said bowed down before him. Which is it? Holman Christian says knelt down before him. New Century Version says bowed down before. Matthew 15.25, then came she and worshipped him. NIV says she came and knelt before him. Young's Literal says bowing to him. And they use the word sir. New America Standard began to bow. Well, I guess she thought about it, but then, you know, thought otherwise. Contemporary English says, knelt down and begged. Rotherham emphasized says, began bowing down. They just can't quite bow all the way. They, they start to, and they think, they think it over. Holman Christian says, knelt before him. Matthew 20:20. 20, 20, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him. Well, the New King James says kneeling down. New America Standard, bowing down. NIV says kneeling. The International Standard says bowed down. Mark 5, 6. There's not too many of these. Uh, worshipped him becomes fell on his knees. Bowed down. Threw himself at his feet. That's from the Weymouth. Matthew 25:31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, all the holy angels with him. Holy is the qualifier there. The New Life Version says all the angels. Well, let's see. Are there fallen angels? Is, uh, is Lucifer going to be there when the Son of Man comes in, in his glory? Are they all just going to join with him? Oh, you're nitpicking. Yeah, I know. I am nitpicking. This stuff's important. You don't want to give any room for any error. You don't want to give room for anyone to try to dig out something that's not there. You don't want to give any, any, what's the expression? You don't let a camel get in your tent. You, you... Words escape me again. English standard says all the angels. NIV, all the angels. Everybody's going to be there. Not just the holy ones. Jehovah's Witnesses, all the angels with him. Matthew twenty three fourteen. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Wow, that one's tough. Maybe they'll soften that a little bit. They will. The New Living doesn't even have it. The NIV doesn't have it. Now, the Holman Christian Standard Bible has it in brackets. When you see something in brackets, they are questioning it. And it's usually followed by a footnote saying, Some manuscripts don't even have this. We don't know whether or not to put it in there. We can't be sure. We can't know if God's given us his word. You know, who could know these things? Uh, and by the way, if they do bother to publish this, Greater damnation becomes harsher punishment. Now, what's what's a harsher punishment? I, it's a slap on the wrist. New American Standard has it in quotes with a footnote. Greater condemnation. You know, when a terrorist does something wrong in a bunch of countries, they release a statement to the press. You know, we, you know, insert the name of the country here. We condemn this action. There's not any teeth to that. 
they're just making a statement. Condemnation. Mark 11:26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Whoa, there's a that one's tough. We better we better remove that one. New Living has it removed. NIV's removed it. None of these. None of these have it. Jehovah's Witness doesn't have it. At least they're all keeping up with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Job 13.15 Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Well, that's nice. It's good to trust in God. New Revised Standard See, he will kill me. I have no hope. I'd say something's been changed there. The Complete Jewish Bible Look, he will kill me. I don't expect more. World English Bible. Behold, he will kill me. I have no hope. Updated Bible version 1.9. Yes, there is such a thing. Look, he will slay me. I have no hope. Hebrew Names version. Behold, he will kill me. I have no hope. You know, there's about 151 English translations. We could sure use 152. The Bible in basic English. Truly, he will put an end to me. I have no hope. Something's been changed here. Isaiah 7.14 Behold, a virgin shall conceive. You know, some some might nitpick the new living because it says the virgin. Like there's only one left in the entire world. Or it's almost Catholic sounding. The virgin. And I'm not going to pick on that too much. But the the new revised standard really needs some heavy scrutiny the young woman is with child well that happens every day lots of young women are discovered that they're going to be pregnant or they are pregnant excuse me this is not a miracle they've taken this miracle out the bible in basic english a young woman is now with child now earlier i mentioned the two bible families and how they differed from each other well, I'm going to now show you what the Bible had to say about them. So do you accept the Bible as your final authority? Is there a law of first mention or first impressions? When the Bible introduces something or someone, does it set the tone? And if so, what tone did the Bible set when it introduced Egypt, which is where Alexandria is? In Genesis chapter 12, we kind of get a first impression of Egypt. This is the first time it gets mentioned. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Abraham basically is saying, If I go to Egypt, they're going to kill me and take my wife. This is negative. Joseph gets sold to the Egyptians. And that we find in Genesis chapter 37. This, of course, is very, very negative. And by the way, Joseph left instructions to not even leave his remains behind in Egypt. He didn't even like it for a suitable place to be buried in. And now slavery. Slavery is often associated with Egypt, and that's very negative. And the book of Exodus starts off with the very subject. God calls Egypt a house of bondage. We find that in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And God calls Egypt an iron furnace. And that's in Jeremiah chapter 11. Which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. Now, God doesn't even want you to get a horse from Egypt. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, this is well before the people of Israel even had a king. It would be many, many years. But God knew at one point they're going to get a king. So I'm going to go ahead and lay down some ground rules for that. And this is one of them. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. And the last part there, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. 
And of course, in First Kings we find Solomon had horses brought up out of Egypt. Now he should have known better. Also, he started to collect a lot of things. Wives and gold, and I'm just throwing this verse in there. Just to show you a particular number that gets added up, and I don't know if, does that number have any importance? Is this just a coincidence, or is God really trying to say something right off the bat there? And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter. Now he's looking to Egypt for potential brides. I wonder what kind of effect that's going to have. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech. Now, how exactly do you worship Molech? Oh, that's right. With child's infant sacrifices. I'd say we've come down a lot. And this is what happens when you deal with Egypt. You start to do all kinds of things you wouldn't normally do. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Well now, maybe Egypt can be used as an example, a teaching tool. If God wanted to call Jerusalem a bad name, Maybe he's going to call them Egypt and Sodom. Talk about bad company to keep. Now, more specifically about Egypt is Alexandria. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians. The first mention of people from Alexandria, Egypt, will later cause Stephen to be accused of many things and to be stoned to death. This is still a negative, negative, negative. And of course, both ships that were taking Paul to Rome to stand trial were from Alexandria. Now you're going to say, why am I even bothering to mention the ship and where it came from? Well, I wouldn't if it were just one. And of course, that first one shipwrecks. But then they go out and they get a second ship, and it just happens to be from Alexandria. I, I kind of don't think there's any coincidences here. 